Good to see all of you today. We have special visitors with us today. There he is right there. Brother and Mrs. Dewey Jones. How many of you know them? Lift your hands up there, Brother Jones. You know Brother Jones? Miss Jones? He's been a pastor in this association for a number of years. He pastored at uh, Mount Airy. He pastored at, and just retired from Crossroads Baptist Church right over in Parsons. He has a very interesting uh, career in past. He was a basketball coach in high school. He worked for Lifeway, the promotion of books. And uh, he is a pastor, I think maybe as a music director in some churches and maybe educational director. So he's quite, uh, got quite a past and experience. And he says he's retiring. I've heard that from other pastors, too. I've heard they were going to retire. But we're glad to have them today. They're precious friends, and they're, they're here with us today, and we appreciate that so much. And Debbie, what a good job leading the music today. Thank you. We appreciate that. The choir did great, and we're just glad to be in the Lord's house. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, this is Memorial Day season. And we, I was coming in this morning and I saw all the flags, especially Parker's Crossroads. Parker's Crossroads is filled with flags during uh, this time of year throughout uh, uh, the, uh, July. And I heard, I, I heard a story a long time ago that just came to mind. You, you perhaps heard it's an old story about this uh, very rough man. I mean, God, ungodly sinful man got gloriously saved. And he, he witnessed to everybody that he would see. Everybody came to his house. He, he witnessed to them. So this woman kept coming to their house on Saturday morning and giving him some literature and inviting him to come to their church. And, and uh, he got to looking at it, and he noticed the term uh, Jehovah Witness on it. So he said, I don't know who these are. He, he said, I'm a Jehovah Witness myself. I'm witness for Jehovah, but I don't know who this group is. And so he went to his pastor and, his, and, and asked his pastor, he said, Pastor, who are the Jehovah Witness? We have this woman who comes to our house every Saturday morning and uh, talks to us about the Jehovah Witnesses and what they believe. And the pastor began to tell him some of the things as they don't salute the flag and and don't serve their country in in uh, military in the military, and and some other things. And he listened carefully, and he left. And he said, "Well, uh, I'll, I'll see her this Saturday." And so throughout the week, he he got a big flag, huge flag, and put it over his fireplace. And uh, so. Uh, he got all the family together. And they were ready for this woman to come on Saturday morning. So he, he saw her coming up the aisle and, uh, or up the, the driveway. And, and he said, here she comes now. Is everybody ready? So she knocked on the door. And he opened the door and just pulled her inside the house and brought her into the, into the living room and, and said, now, ma'am, it's our practice here to sing uh, two songs. Uh, God bless America and the, and the Star Spangled Banner. We salute the flag before we talk to anybody. So they sung the, uh, the two songs and, and then they saluted the flag. And he looked at her and said, what do you think about that now? And she said, well, I've been selling Avon for 20 years. <laughs> and this is the first time I've ever experienced anything like this. <laughs> it's good to witness to folks when they come to our houses, right? It's good to witness to them. I want you to turn your Bibles to Romans. Romans, if you will, please. The great book of Romans. Paul's letter to the church at Romans. At Rome, that is. At Rome. You know, I was reading this week a song by Miss Ruth K. Jones. And she penned a very heartwarming song entitled, In Times Like These. She said, in times like these, you need a Savior. 
You need an anchor. You need, need the Bible. In time like, times like these, be not idle. In times like these, I have a Savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. Then the refrain, uh, I'm very pure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. He's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Let me say to you this morning that in uncertain times, and we're living in uncertain, fearful, dangerous times, in uncertain times and stressful and fearful times, we need the rock. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the solid rock. And we need to know him, not just about him, but we need to know him personally. We need to know uh, that we'll never be separated from the love of God. And for that assurance, we go to Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. I know that you are familiar with these passages. Perhaps you could quote part of them. In the Romans chapter, uh, chapter 8 and uh, verses uh, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of God, the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now these words of Paul gives us the basis of our hope and our comfort in the hard places in life, the difficult times in life, the stressful times and the scared times. So in the hard places, Paul reminds us of God's love for us. He says, who shall separate us from the love of God? God's love is amazing. And I really appreciate that song, The Amazing Grace of God. Uh, we especially understand how God might uh, reject us or might ignore us or even condemn us. But why and how he loves us is astounding. It is actually unprecedented. It is something that is unparalleled in this world of uh, the love of God for us. F.M. Uh, Lehman, or F.N. Lehman, described God's love so beautifully when he wrote one of my favorite, favorite songs. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hill. O oh, love of God, how rich and poor, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. God's love can be seen everywhere. Someone said, The mountains are God's love piled high. The oceans are God's love spread out. And the flowers are God's love in bloom. But the greatest and the purest expression of God's love is when He gave His Son on the cross of Calvary for our sins. In Romans chapter 5 and verses 5 through 8, Hear these verses, and they're very precious verses. They tell us of God's love for us. Beginning with verse 5, chapter 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. For when we were yet without Christ, and without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely or, or perhaps for a righteous man, one would, one would die. Yet peradventure or, 
or perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrated his love for us when he died on the cross, when he shed his blood for us, when he gave himself for us to pay uh, for our sins. So in the hard places, we must not forget that God loves us. God's love for us is unconditional, unconditional love. I remember reading about one Sunday morning, the little boy I looked up to his dad while they were in the worship service and asked his dad, uh, how does God love us? And he said, son, God loves us with an unconditional love. And the little boy waited a few seconds, and you know what he asked next. He said, Daddy, uh, what does unconditional love mean? His dad thought for a moment, and he came up with an example. He said, Son, you remember uh, when those boys that you play with about your age lives two doors down from us, that their daddy gave them a pretty little puppy, friendly puppy, for their birthday. You remember how they treated that puppy? They threw rocks at him, stones at him, and sticks at him, and, and treated him in such a terrible way. But when all that was over and they quit doing that, you remember what the little puppy did? The little puppy came to them and started licking them on the hands and on the face, just loving them. He said, son, that is unconditional love. You see, that's what God has for us, unconditional love. Makes no difference what we do or what we don't do. God still loves us the same. He won't stop loving us when we stop loving him. He won't stop loving us when we do things that we should not do, when we sin, when we turn our backs on Him. He still loves us just as much. His love is unconditional. Then God's love for us is eternal. When the sun shines no more and the moon no longer reflects the light of the sun and the stars fall out of their sockets and the heavens and the earth are recreated, God will still love us. His love is eternal love. He loved us before the foundation of the world and He will continue to love us all in eternity. Not only is God's love unconditional, but God's love is eternal, and God's love loves us with a maximum love. He can't love us any more than He loves us right now because He loves us with a maximum love. He loves us forever with a maximum love. Now, it just blows my mind when I think about that. Think about God, the creator of the world, uh, the one that uh, spoke this universe uh, into place and, and, and took from the earth and created man and took from the rib of man and created woman. Uh, the one who is sovereign over this universe is in control of everything. He loves me with a maximum love. It just, it just blows me away. I remember what Gypsy Smith said. He said, I can't get over the wonder of it all. And it will just take you to the depths of thoughts and to the height of thoughts when you think about God's love for us, a maximum love. But then there's a second thing. In the hard places, uh, Paul reminds us that God's love surrounds us. Paul tells us, that God's love covers every circumstance of life and nothing can separate us from the love of God. Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Before he answers his question, he lists seven tragedies that might cause us to think that God does not love us. Shall tribulation, meaning a trying experience or, or trouble or hardship, uh, shall distress... Uh, that is suffering, pain, and discomfort. Uh, shall persecution, speaks of affliction, harassment, distress, and uh, oppression uh, from the enemy of Christ. Uh, shall famine, that is lack of food, shall nakedness, uh, having very little uh, material things, and shall peril, uh, times of danger, shall, shall the sword, and that's threatened with, with death. Then he answers his own 
his own question. He said in verse 37, No, in all of these we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So Paul reinforces this marvelous truth that God loves us. Paul gives us ten contrasts in verses 38 through 39. He said, for I am persuaded that he says he's convinced, he's convinced. There's no doubt in his mind. I am persuaded, convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death or life can't do it. The angels won't do it. Other heavenly rulers or powers can't keep God's love from us. Our fears for today and worries about tomorrow can't take God's love from us. The highest places above the sky or the deepest places in the ocean cannot keep God's love from us cannot keep God from loving us. There is nothing in all of creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul mentions everything that might seem to offer a threat to God's love for us, but nothing does. So in the hard places of life, God love surrounds us. And then there's a third thing. In the hard places, Paul reminds us that God's love makes us more than conquerors in Him. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, Paul mentions tragedies that may come to us, as we mentioned a minute ago, tribulation, distress, famine, persecution, nakedness, peril, sword. And Paul says, none of these events separate us from the love of God. In verse 37, all of these, Paul says, we're more than conquerors. We're more than victorious through him that loved us. Now, what is Paul saying? Well, he is saying, because of his love for us, we don't have to be overcome. We don't have to be whipped down. We don't have to be defeated by our circumstances. But we can be overcomers through Him. Now God gives us strength to, to go through life, uh, life and, and go through the hard places of life. He supplies inner braces for our outer pressures and, and that we have every day and every week or every month uh, that we experience. He supplies inner, inner braces for our pressure uh, we experience. Outer pressure we experience. The greatest enemies we face are what? The greatest enemies that we face are, first of all, sin. And second is suffering. And the last thing is death. We experience sin, suffering, and death. That's our greatest enemies. But we have victory over sin through his death. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, my favorite verse in all the Bible, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, some people try to tell us that that verse says that Jesus sinned. No, it doesn't say that Jesus sinned. It simply says that Jesus was treated as a sinner, that we might be treated as a saint. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went to the cross of Calvary willingly, and he sacrificially gave his life on that cross and shed his life's blood to pay for our sins that we might be free, that our sins might be forgiven, and they might be placed under the blood, and that we be saved forever and forever. So we have victory over sin through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, because His blood paid for that sin. God has a holy wrath towards sin, and that wrath must strike somewhere, either the sinner or the sinner's substitute. And thank God Jesus Christ became our substitute on that cross, and He bore our judgment upon Himself, and He took the condemnation of God. He paid the price for our sins, and the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon Him 
shall be saved. You see, in order to be saved, you must accept what Jesus did on the cross. And when you accept what Jesus did on the cross, the Bible tells us that we'll be saved when you put your faith, your trust in the, in the substitutionary work of Jesus, you are saved. So we have victory over sin. Our past sins, our present sins, our future sins are under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, that ought to cause us to say amen, 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 right? That is wonderful to know that our sins are under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over sin through his death. And then second, we have victory over suffering through his presence. I'm reading in the Old Testament in my daily uh, uh, Bible reading. I'm reading uh, in the Old Testament and I'm getting close to where uh, the Israelite people went into Babylonian captivity. But when the Israelite people went into Babylonian captivity, only the strong people and the healthy people were taken and, and the others, the older ones and the, and the weak ones, they were left behind and uh, but as they spent many, many years there in Babylonian captivity, it came time uh, that uh, one of the kings that they were under uh, said that they could go back to Jerusalem. And they realized that uh, uh, their task would be great. The Jewish remnant uh, is faced with the challenge uh, of the long journey home from Babylonian captivity and, and the difficult task of rebuilding uh, they had many reasons to be fearful about rebuilding the homes and rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the wall and, and getting established there. Uh, but they had one big reason not to be afraid. Listen to what it is. And the reason is recorded in Isaiah through the prophet Isaiah as he told the people what God said. In Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, here's what he said. He said to the Israelite people, and he's saying it to us this morning, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then you go to verse 13 of that same chapter. Uh, here's what Isaiah wrote. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not. I will help you. Those verses were true for the Israelite people and they're true for us today. The Lord is with us. The writer of the book of Hebrews wrote, For he has, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now this promise was made to Joshua. To, made to Joshua when, uh, uh, when he succeeded Moses. Uh, I read that this morning in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31 and beginning with verse, uh, uh, verse 7. Here is what uh, the Hebrew writer is quoting in verse 7 of, uh, of Deuteronomy chapter 30. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel be strong and of good courage. For thou must go with thee or with uh, this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. Did you get that promise? That promise is for us. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. Now that chapter in John chapter 14 is a great chapter. Many promises in that chapter. One of the great promises is this, that Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send another comforter, another of the same kind. And he's not only going to be with you, but he's going to be in you. He'll be closer than I ever was with you. He said, I'll never leave you. And listen, child of God, this morning, you're saved by God's wonderful and marvelous grace. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the 
the Holy Spirit lives within your heart and he'll never ever leave you regardless of the circumstances that you experience, regardless of the trouble and the heartache and the pain and the difficulty and the, and the broken dreams. The, the Holy Spirit of God is with you to comfort you and bless you and take you through the, the valleys of life. And some valleys are long, long. You think they're never going to end. But listen, when you started in that valley, uh, you were already on your way out and there's an end to that valley. There's an end. It may seem it's so distant, but there is an end and the Lord Jesus is with us. So in times of of rejection when the one that you thought never would leave you, never would walk out of your life, walks out and says, I don't want you anymore. I don't need you anymore. I'm leaving in times of rejection. God is with us and, and we have the comfort of the Holy Spirit and He will strengthen us in times of loneliness. Loneliness when, uh, when you sit in your house for days and weeks and, and nobody knocks on the door. Nobody calls. Nobody visits. And, and you're there lonely. Let me tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ is with you. He lives within your heart in times of depression. In times when you don't want to raise the blinds, you don't want to open open the doors, you don't want the sun to come in, you want it to be dark and, and you're depressed. And, but the Lord is with you during that time of depression. In times of, of discouragement when you failed in, the, in your project and you failed in your dreams, God is there to, to encourage you in times of despair and hopelessness and trouble. He is with us. Us in times of declining health and it seems to never end. Jesus Christ is with us to comfort us and strengthen us and encourage us. He never leaves us. Christ is with us. We have victory over death through his resurrection. I love this one. Paul said, He that hath abolished death, that is, rendered it powerless. Death is powerless over us and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 1 Timothy 1 and 10. You see, God gives us victory over sin. He gives us victory over suffering. And He gives us victory over death. One day, uh, one day uh, the Lord is going to come. One day He's going to step out on a cloud. And one day the dead in Christ will rise. And those that are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's called the rapture. That will happen one day. But listen, my friends, uh, when we breathe this last breath here on this earth, we're going to breathe the fresh air of heaven the very next second. When the door of this earth closes, the eternal door of heaven will open. They'll put this grave, this body out there in the grave and it will deteriorate over time. But when Jesus comes and he puts his foot out there and sits on that cloud, the Bible says, uh, the two witnesses says he's going back. To heaven, and he's going to come back the same way he went to heaven. The scripture says he went to heaven on a cloud. He's coming back on a cloud. And he's going to call the, the dead in Christ. He's going to call those bodies out. And he's going to say, it's time. Get up out of that grave. And, and the graves are going to open, or they may not open. I don't know. I've heard all kinds of spiritualizing on this. I've heard people say, really, it's going to be a big mess out there in the cemetery when Jesus comes come. Dirt's going to be everywhere. It's going to be thrown because those, those people are going to come out. I don't know about that. I don't think that'll happen, to be honest with you. I think that God, God has more power than that. He'll just bring that body out of the grave and the, and the, and the ground won't even be bothered. And, and those are lost be left behind and those are saved will be taken out and our bodies will be changed. This body, not some other body, but this body will be changed and soul and body joined together victory over death. Satan cannot give us a, a eternal death, but God can give us eternal life. We'll live, live forever. Amen and amen. Walter Winchell was a famous radio news commentator during World War II. 
Once after a particularly dark week during which the port of Singapore, Singapore fell, he closed with the broadcast with, the, with this sentence. Singapore has fallen, but the rock of ages stands. Sometimes we feel as though our world has fallen. And when we feel that way, we have to be reminded that the rock of ages stands. Listen, Christ lives. We serve a risen Savior. We serve a Savior that is real and alive. Christ loves. He loves us with an eternal love. And let me tell you, Christ lifts. How many of you agree that Christ lifts? Christ lifts us, lifts us out of the depths of sin and mock and mar when no one could lift us. Jesus Christ reached down and lifts us up and gives us the abundant life and joy and forgiveness of sin. Christ will strengthen and sustain us if we look to him. The psalmist wrote, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer, that is, he will not allow your foot to be moved, or that is, your foot to slip. He that keepeth thee will not slumber, that is, your protector will not slumber. The Lord does not sleep. The Lord Jesus is always watching over us. He's our keeper. Why? Because he loves us. I don't understand it, folks. I don't understand it. I can't even begin to understand why God would love us. But he takes, he takes joy in loving his children. Amen. Amen. Let me close with this. What a great Savior we have. What a great, great Savior we have. Do you know Him? Do you know Him? Do you know Him? As we go up and down these pews, do you know Him? Do you know Him? Do you know Him? Do you know Him? You know him? I'm not talking about know about Him. Scholars know about him, but they don't know him. They know about him, but they don't know him. Many people in our pews know about him, but they don't know him. You can know the Christ of history and not know him in a saving experience. I know George, George Washington as a historical figure. I know he was the first president of the United States. I know he was a great general in the War of Independence. I know that he did great things for our nation, but I don't have a relationship with George Washington. I don't know him. I've just, I just know him by what I've read about him. I don't know him. But listen, I know Jesus Christ, not just about him, but I know him because I've had a deep experience with him. He saved me. He came into my heart. He lives with me. He never leaves me. He walks with me. He talks with me. And I talk to him. And I read about him from the word of God. Do you really know Jesus? And a saving experience. Do you know him personally? If not, why not receive him this morning as your savior? Why not come and say, yes, Lord, yes, and then you're here and you've gone so far away from God. You've gone so far from Him that you are unaware of His love for you. You can get there. You can get there. You can get so far away from God that you are unaware of His love. And you can do that and be in these these pews sitting here every Sunday, you can be so far away from him that you will not even be aware of God's love. The prodigal son always comes to mind. He went out there in the far country. He was unaware of his father's love for him.
He was unaware of it. And his daddy never stopped loving him, loved him more and more every day with outreached arms. He was, he was waiting to, to see him come down the lane and give him a great big hug and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and a robe on his back. He said, you're not going to be a, be a slave here. You're a son. You're a son. And you'll always be a son in this family. Listen, but that prodigal boy was unaware of his father's love. Are you out there today? Unaware. Of God's love for you. Oh, you're saved, but you're unaware of God's love for you. Let's stand up. Heads bowed, eyes closed. As our pianist comes, our heads are bowed. Some of you need to just come to this altar this morning and pray.